synthesizer in uh, the Bay Area simultaneously when uh, Bob Moog was inventing it in uh, upstate New York. So there was nothing to be revolutionary about, but it's funny how people think of it as a revolutionary synthesizer. Um, it's revolutionary in the fact that there was nothing like it that came before it. I've been a, a, uh, a longtime Buchla user. I got introduced to the Buchla as a college student in Pittsburgh. Uh, so it seems like I have to raise my audio level. Is that correct? Is, can everyone hear me? I think you sound great. Okay, great. Okay, I just got a little note saying to raise my level. You can come up 2 dB. <laughs> 2 dB. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> okay, how about that? Anyways, uh, I got introduced to the Buchla instruments as a student at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. I was actually enrolled at Carnegie Mellon University. So this would be in 1974. I was totally into new music and, and electronic music, but at Carnegie Mellon, all that was available was computer music where you sat down and typed numbers into like a teletype machine and got a couple of bloops and bleeps out. But the University of Pittsburgh had an official electronic music studio. And in that studio was a 100 series Buchla. Now the 100 series was, created by Don in the early 1960s on a commission from the great and amazing Mort Subotnik, which I'm sure most of you know, and his partner, Raymond Sender, mm. at the San Francisco Tape Music Center. Uh, they received a Rockefeller grant, I believe it's a Rockefeller grant, for 500 bucks to achieve, you know, to create some kind of electronic music instrument. And somehow they hooked up with this wonderful inventor whose name is Donald Buchla, who was designing wiring as the, as the uh, rumor goes, at least for NASA, for their space shots. Uh, and Donald came up with this thing called, which they called a synthesizer. Now I wanna be really clear, Don never ever called what he created a synthesizer. He wasn't trying to synthesize anything. He was creating a musical instrument. Uh, so when, whenever you sat down with Don, you never mentioned the word synthesizer. It would really tick him off because that's not what he uh, was doing. Um, and so he came up with the 100 series. Now, I fell in love with the Buchla 100 series. The, the uh, collection of modules we had at the University of Pittsburgh were really phenomenal. and. As I uh, got more familiar with Buchla, especially later on in life here, I realized that some of those modules were one of a kind modules. And that's kind of the thing that was happening in those days, right? I mean, if you wanted to buy an electronic music instrument in 1962, what were your choices? An electric guitar, an electric organ, maybe a theremin, if you could get uh, uh, Robert Moog to build you one. That was really, really it in terms of being able to do electronic music. Of course, everybody did it with tape in those days. You record sine waves from sine wave generators from scientific laboratories onto tape and do all kinds of crazy things and edit tape. And well, that was a long time ago. Uh, so after spending a couple of years uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, I graduated Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and uh, my I got an introduction to Don Buchla because that was really the only way you could get Don to build you an instrument. You had to be introduced, right? And the only places you could get these instruments were really at institutions, universities. Uh, but I wanted my own and I had, was gifted uh, $10,000 by my grandparents. And I said, you know what? I want to buy a Buchla and go to New York and try and do sound design for commercials. And that was really my my dream. So I hopped in my 73 Super Beetle uh, with my letter of introduction in hand and I had called in advance and I drove from Pittsburgh to Berkeley, California in search of Don Buchla. Uh, I showed up at the designated spot in Berkeley and uh, I, I, didn't, I couldn't find a door. 
you know, I had the address right and there wasn't a door to the Buchla workshop. I was looking around and I looked down and there was this little, little door. It was probably four feet tall. And I knocked on it and that was the door. It was like entering into the Hobbit's cave. And inside was Don Buchla's workshop with his, uh, with the people that were soldering and making modules. And I sat down with Don and told him what I wanted to do. And he showed me some of the new modules that hadn't been released yet. What he was showing me were the 200 series modules. I'd only worked on the 100 series. And the only time I ever saw a 200 series set of modules in person was when Mort Subotnik came to the University of Pittsburgh. Um, it was the University of Pittsburgh ballroom. You'd have to imagine this. It's a very large place. And in each corner, front and back and in rear were, were stacks of Altec A7 Voice of the Theater speakers. These are huge, powerful speakers. And Mort Subotnik was sitting in the center with his 200 series cabinets. And I have to tell you, it was a transformative experience. I've never heard sounds like that moving in and around the audience. That it was at that moment that I knew I had to have a bukla. That was my instrument. That's the sound I wanted. I had no idea how it was, how the 200 series worked. So I ended up in uh, Berkeley, California, sat down with Don. We designed a system. I picked out the modules. I left him a ch down payment check. A month later, he asked for the rest of the money. <laughs> I haven't, I didn't see anything uh, yet. And uh, four months later, without even the notice, right, that it was on its way, I get a little shipping notice delivered to my front door or something saying you have to drive over here and pick up this package from uh, Berkeley, California. And in that was the book. And I'll never forget opening it up for the first time. Um, it was completely uh, mind blowing because, you know, as you can see, uh, buklas are very, very <laughs> colorful, wonderful instruments. Um, here's the shot of the 200 series I'll be doing tonight also. So can you imagine, you know, being a 22 year old and opening this up and owning this instrument? Well, I did go to New York and I built a recording studio and, uh, ended up uh, doing a, a lot of other things. So I'm just to give you a quick little history here. I'm gonna share my screen. Hold on a second. Hey Steve, a quick question. Is this yeah. the Bukla from that time period or is this the newer Bukla from the last 10 years? This is uh, a newer Bukla. Um, I'll what show you- What became of the original 200? That's a very good question. I appreciate you answering, uh, asking that question. The original 200 series, um, well, it, it kind of aged, right? I, I bought it in, in 76. I think I sold it in 91. And by then it, things were breaking like crazy. Um, back in those days, Buchlis kind of had a lifespan uh, and I wasn't using it. It was sitting over in the corner of my studio. By that time, I was doing mainly computer music and composing music for TV shows, as, as Mike uh, introduced. And uh, I decided to sell it. And I sold it, and uh, now it's owned by Danny Carey of the band Tool. Um, interesting story there. Um, they're doing a documentary on the TV show Reading Rainbow, and um, they wanted to film me recreating the sound I used, created on a bukla, which I'll play for you a little bit later. Uh, that was the signature for that TV show. So sometime in the spring or summer, I'm going to be flying out to Danny Carey's studio, sitting in front of my original bukla that I haven't seen in 20 years and recreating the Reading Rainbow theme song. So that's going to be uh, a, a, real, a real blast for me. Um, thank you for asking that question. So here's a little uh, a keynote thing I want to share with you guys. So uh, here's a picture of me playing that original bukla. I was in a band. I, when I came to New York, I joined a, a group called the Electronic Art Ensemble. Uh, we played everywhere, the kitchen, Carnegie Hall, uh, all up and down the East Coast and into Canada. We were pretty famous in our day. 
And as a matter of fact, Robert Moog wrote our album cover liner notes and we got re reviewed in New Yorker and the New York Times, all favorable too. Um, here's a picture of me. I don't know if you can see me in the center, but you can see that original Buchla and that guy with the thick black curly hair. Well, that's me playing it in Washington Square Park. Um, here's a, um, I'm, that's me on the left playing it in uh, performance space in Toronto. And this is the picture of the band. That's me in the back standing up, the electronic art ensemble. Uh, this is vintage like 1980, 81, something like that. Uh, here's a shot of me playing in Berlin. A shot of me playing, uh, I forget where this is. I can't remember the name of the church. Uh, me and Jordan, uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, well, Jordan's a very good friend of mine. We in the, have played a lot of music together and we recorded a lot of our compositions. And he's still mad at me for breaking his keyboard, by the way. That's just a joke. Um, we released an album called Intersonic. Um, I have an album on Bandcamp called Oceana. I've been involved in the Buchla Now series. It's a really fun uh, cassette tape, <laughs> talk about retro, featuring Todd Barton and Suzanne Ciani and me and Caitlin Aurelia Smith and others. Uh, really good. If you can, if you buy this, you do get the downloads too. Uh, this is an album I'm gonna be releasing in the next couple of weeks. It's a bunch of uh, easel etudes, I'm calling it, improvisations. Uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> I hooked up with Greg Kramer, who was one of the fellows in the Electronic Art Ensemble, and we recorded an album a year ago uh, that hasn't been released yet, but that's coming out soon. That's, this cover is not the actual cover. Um, so anyways, I got my bukla. Let me, let me stop sharing for a second so I can see the screen. There we go. So I got my 200 series, which you just saw. I brought it to New York and I started making a living doing electronic music, which was crazy, and playing in this great band called the Electronic Art Ensemble. So I've been a Buchla user, uh, performer for many, many years. I, I don't even, I don't want to count them, probably around 40 years now. Now the technology has changed, thank God. Uh, the systems that I have, which you see here, this is the, this is the 200 series in a Skylab case. Um, the Skylab holds 10 modules and it has that, uh, that little uh, keyboard thing that uh, I'll show you in a little bit. I also have the, um, the wonderful easel, which is a very unique and incredible music you know, instrument. This, this instrument, by the way, was designed, I think in 19 or released in 1973. And they have new versions now that, uh, are just un unbelievable. This is such a fun instrument to play. I recommend you, uh, after you listen to me perform a little bit later, you really, if you're into Buchla, this is a great way to start and it's not that expensive. Uh, it looks like someone else wants to get into the room. I'll let them in. So let me go back to my other camera. So what makes Buchla's different than, you know, most other electronic musical instruments? Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about common Buchla stuff, I'm going to call it, right? Uh, like, unlike Eurorack, I have a big Eurorack system over here on my right. Um, Buchla when he was coming up with this idea of creating an electronic musical instrument, thought that he wanted to separate the things that were actually making the sound, the signals, from the things that were the expression of those sounds, which is the control voltages. One of my good friends, Todd Barton says, you're only as expressive as your control voltages. And the, the rhythmic or pulse, uh, parts of sound, uh, which are pulses. So Buchla said, well, the things that actually make sound signals are going to be over here. Pulses are separate. They're doing the rhythm and control voltages are separate and they, they, 
They do all of our robotic knob turning. So it's always been about performance for Don. Um, and that's real different than the Eurorack standard where it's any cable anywhere. Um, in a Buchla system, that, that doesn't work. And I'll show you why. Hold on a second. Um, because all, um, all the control voltages use what is called a banana jack and a banana cable because they're DC voltages, right? You don't, you don't, uh, you don't need uh, a positive and negative or anything going to ground. It's a DC voltage. Uh, and what's great about banana jacks is that you can stack them and connect them in all kinds of fun, different ways. So yes, you look over at my 200 series. I'll, I'll take you over there really quick again. Oh, that's the wrong one. Here we go. And if you look closely, I don't even know if you can see, you, you see a lot of stacked cables. Uh, that, that's what makes Banana Jacks really, really handy. Now I know Eurorack makes uh, stacked cables now too, which is totally cool. Um, the other thing that's really great about a banana jack, this is a rock solid connection. I don't know if you've ever been playing your instrument, your modulars, and you get in there and, and you turn a few knobs and you accidentally knock out a couple of cables and suddenly what was sounding good before doesn't work anymore. I can tell you right now, it doesn't happen with a banana jack. You almost need two hands to pull this thing out of a faceplate. Um, the other thing, uh, all uh, the other thing that's different between Buchla and Eurorack too is that um, rather than using a standard, uh, I guess it's called a mini jack plug, Buchla's use something called a tiny jacks. It's a switchcraft. It's a little bit longer. It's a little bit wider. Uh, and he used them because these cables are all um, uh, shielded. So that's the kind of why he decided to go that way. Um, he also, I've heard that he separated, also separated the control voltages from the signals. It's because it was really hard and difficult in those days, and maybe still is, to create a circuit that worked really good for control voltages and signals or audio. So by separating him, he could, he could make the audio sound really, really good, and it could make sure that the control voltages were as pure as he wanted them to be. Um, okay, so that's, that's one of the main things. Uh, another thing that's different from Buchla to uh, uh, Eurorack is that it's, uh, Eurorack is 1.2 volts per octave, right? It makes sense because 12 semitones. So you have a, a tenth, if I did that right, <laughs> uh, per uh, semitone. Uh, Buchla has always been 10 volts per octave, right? So. Um, and there's a, probably a good reason for that. It's from the school uh, of music that Don was coming from and Morton Sabotnik and Raymond Sender, they weren't thinking about playing melodies. You know, the original Buchla uh, systems, synthesizers, instruments, excuse me, Don, um, didn't have a black and white keyboard, not like what Moog was doing on the East Coast. These things were more avant-garde. They were much more into noise and interesting sounds and, and, you know, it was very hard to play Melancholy Baby in E flat, as a good friend of mine used to say. Um, the, the buklas, you know, the oscillators drifted, and that was okay. That was all part of the fun of it. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a little more loosey-goosey way to, 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 to work with sound. Um, so the control voltages are, are, are 10 volts rather than uh, uh, 12 volts per octave. The pulses uh, are 10 volts uh, DC, right? And with a, uh, a five volt sustain. So if it's, the sustain stays at five volts, if you feed it five volts, it will sustain. And signals are signals. They're just the raw material of electronic music, right? The output of an oscillator in Buchla terms is a signal. And you can't plug a signal into a control voltage input and you can't, you know, the, the two worlds just don't meet um, unless you take a cable and put a banana cable, uh, plug on one side and an audio plug on the other. But that can do some damage. So we, we tend not to do that, even though I've done that in the past for some of the coolest sounds I've ever made. Um, 
Another thing that's different is the color coding. And um, it for, for Buchla, uh, control voltage inputs are black. Let me see if I can put this up on the screen. Let me share this, actually. Uh, in fact, I'm going to do that right now. Share my screen again. There we go. Share. Keynote. Boom. Here we go. And I hope everyone can see that okay. It looks good from my end. Um, so everything's color coded. Not only are the cables different, but everything is color coded. CV inputs are black and sometimes gray. Um, they're gray usually when it's another uh, way to control um, a parameter. Um, for instance, on, on, on the uh, low pass gates, CVs will, the, the gray ones take velocities, which will affect the, the black CV inputs. Anyways, anyway, CV outputs are blue and sometimes violet and occasionally green. I'm not exactly sure of why, but we can, I, I think I know. Um, pulse inputs are always orange, though they look very red. They're a very reddish orange and pulse outputs are always red. Um, the easel has its own little color coding just to help you navigate. Um, so those are the main things that make the Buchla different um, in terms of the way you navigate it. There's lots of other things that make the Buchla different. And another one is that little section down below and it's called remote enable. Now people are always saying, why are Buchlas so expensive? Well, they they can be, there's no doubt about that. However, think of this, every module in the booklet system has this remote enable switch. And what does that mean? What it means is that every module has the ability to store 30 different presets. Obviously you can't preset the patching, but every knob, every switch, every fine tune control, everything on every module can be saved. Um, so what the way it works is that you set up a patch, right? And usually when, since you're, you're dealing with something that can be saved, you wanna create a patch that is as flexible as possible amongst all the different modules. You hit, there's another module that allows you to hit save and at the, simultaneously every module's knob positions and switch positions are saved into a preset. Um, each module contains its own set of presets, uh, but is called up by a, uh, a single module. And I'll show you that in just a little bit. So here we have a very sophisticated system because not only um, is it complex and very dense, by the way, Buchla modules are very dense in terms of what they can do. Um, everything you create on a Buchla, other than the patch, can be recalled. And in live performance, it just doesn't get any better than that. So let's take a look at uh, a couple of things here. Um, so here are a couple of Buchla modules. Um, over on the left, we have the complex waveform generator, which is in, in uh, <laughs> which is in uh, Eurorack speak, an, an oscillator. In the middle, we have a quad function generator, which is basically a uh, attack decay, you know, uh, uh, generator. And on the right is the famous quad dynamics module which is um, where you'll find the famous low pass gates that Donald came up with using the Vactrol circuitry. So let's take a look at the complex waveform generator. Um, as I told you, um, all most uh, inputs that are voltage control as, are black. And because it's an oscillator, it's gonna have a lot of voltage control inputs. It's a dual, uh, oscillator. All of Don's oscillators are dual. Um, you can see on the bottom left, it says modulation oscillator. And to the right, it says principal oscillator. The principal oscillator is 
based on a sine tone. And if you look at the very top of this of the outputs for the principal oscillator, you'll see the right one has a little sine wave next to it. That sine wave is, will always be a sine wave. However, the output on the left takes that sine wave and using the timbre controls, uh, which you have control of in terms of timbre, symmetry, and high order, basically it's it's wave shaping and wave folding. That sine wave becomes a very complex sound. Um, you'll you you won't find square waves on a uh, on the principal oscillator. Excuse me, I'll take a little drink. You won't find triangle waves. You won't find pulse waves. In terms of oscillations, you won't find sawtooth waves. The sound of a 200 series Buchla and the 200 series E Buchlas are famous for um, the sound, the timbres they get from doing uh, wave shaping and wave folding. Okay, so that's the principal oscillator. Over to the left, you'll see the modulation oscillator, and that's a different beast. You'll notice that um, on the right side, underneath the word range, even though that's not what I'm going to talk about, it does say wave shape. And you see a pulse wave, a square wave, a sine wave. Uh, I thought that's weird. It's like two sides. Oh, and a triangle wave. A triangle looks very signy. Um, and a knob below it that says wave shape. And so you can, you can, um, you can morph between those different wave shapes for your modulation oscillator. And you'll notice right beneath the knob where you can morph between those shapes is a voltage control input. So you can voltage control those wave shapes also. It has uh, at the very bottom in the middle of the modulation oscillator section is a control voltage input. So any kind of control voltage can go in there. And next to that is an FM input. So you can take an, a signal, an audio signal from anywhere and plug it in there and crank up the FM happening to the modulation oscillator. But this is kind of weird. If you think about it, the modulation oscillator's main duty is to modulate the principal oscillator. So if you move up on the left-hand side, you can determine how it modulates the principal oscillator. And you'll notice that mod type says Amplitude modulation, timbre modulation, and pitch modulation. Um, so um, we pitch modulation is FM frequency modulation. Um, it, it's um, the way I like to, to talk about FM is um, imagine a violinist, and I'm going to go back to my. I'm going to stop sharing for a second so I can. Uh, I got a. Sorry, I'm kind of lost in, I can't find my cursor. That is really weird. I want to get, oh, there we go. Stop share. Okay, I'm back. So the way that I like to talk and teach about frequency modulation is imagine a violinist, right? And he's running the bow across the string. That string is the principal oscillator, right? It's vibrating. And when you place your finger, let me try to get on camera here, on the string, you're increasing the pitch of that oscillator. But when you start applying vibrato to that string, you're applying the frequency of your hand rolling on the string to change the frequency of that string. So this vibrato is my modulation oscillator. So as I bow that string, and put a little vibrato, it's like a low frequency oscillator. But if I do it at the speed of audio, like at, let's say 5,000 times a second, which of course I couldn't do, it would create what are called uh, sidebands, more frequencies. Um, and if I increase the amplitude of that wave, imagine if I moved my, my vibrato hand up and down the string like that, suddenly, you know, it would be changing pitch like crazy. And if I could do that 5,000 times a second, well, that's frequency modulation. So my, my finger would be moving at the speed of sound, so to speak. Um, uh, amplitude modulation is, is quite different. Amplitude modulation, which is really interesting because you don't see amplitude modulation 
the ability to do amplitude modulation a lot on Eurorack synths. It's, you know, you see, you hear about FM a lot, but you don't hear about AM. And basically it's the same thing. It's changing the, the uh, amplitude of the sound based on the frequency of, uh, of an oscillator. Uh, and it has a very unique sound and I really enjoy it. Let me bring up this slide again, share screen. Here we go, share. Play, boom. Okay. Uh, the other, uh, I'm over there on the left side of the complex waveform generator. I don't, I don't think I can run my cursor. Oh, well. Um, the other type of modulation you'll notice is timbre modulation. And basically that is changing this, the symmetry, or actually the wave shaping of that, uh, uh, of the principal oscillator. Now, there's a little button next to where it says mod type, amplitude, timbre, and pitch. And when you click on it, you can select amplitude, timbre, or pitch, or variations of all three. So you can do all three at the same time, which can create some really amazing uh, sounds, which I'll show you in a little bit. Okay, the module in the center is the quad function generator. It's basically where you set your attacks and decays. Um, however, You'll notice uh, on the upper left where it says inputs, it has three um, three different uh, LEDs with wave shapes next to them. Uh, when you tap on that gray button, the top one and isolate the top one, that means that it's it's repeating. In other words, it becomes really an LFO. So the the uh, the attack and decay generators also become LFOs, depending. And the speed of their attack and decay and the wave shape of their attack and decay are determined by the attack and decay times, which you can set with those two knobs. And of course, you can voltage control both the attack and the decay. So you can get some really amazing LFO shapes by making sure it's in repeat mode, which is that upper little button thing there, and, uh, and uh, playing with the attack and decay. Now, what's really cool with the Buchla design is that every time uh, the attack and decay completes its cycle, right, attack and decay, um, it puts out a pulse. So not only does this thing, <laughs> uh, is, an, is a, uh, you know, a, 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 like a, a attack and decay generator to open up a gate, so to speak, but it's also an LFO and it's also a pulse generator. So you can see that there's a lot of density just right there. In fact, you could take the output of, there's four of them there, as you can see. You can take the output of one to have it trigger another, and then it, down at the bottom, you can mix those together and create all kinds of different uh, shapes. You can put them into quadrature mode so that the, the attack of the first one starts to go up, and when it gets halfway, it starts the attack of the second one, and they, they kind of uh, roll together in, kind of a 360 degree way that makes it really easy to do circular panning and fun things that you can do on a Buchla system. Um, the module over to the right is the quad dynamics manager. Those are basically your, uh, your gates, your VCAs, however you want to call them. Now the, um, there's four of them. You have, um, you can see the black uh, inputs for your voltage controls, for your voltages. Usually what goes into a the quad dynamics manager would be the output, for instance, of one of the function generators. That would create the, uh, the amplitude shape for the audio that you want to do. Down at the bottom, you would put in your, your signal, whether it be noise or an oscillator or some external voltage. Um, right up from where you see input A down at the bottom, notice that you have this Again, you have a button and you have two LEDs. So what's what's unusual about Buchla is that, uh, for instance, channel A, which I'm looking at right now, you can determine, you can say, oh, I just want that to be a low pass filter. So by clicking on that button, you can highlight low pass, or you can say, oh, I don't want a filter in this circuit at all. I just want it to be a gate. And so by clicking on the button again, the gate will light up. Or if you hit it again, both buttons will light up and that gives you what is called the low pass gate sound, the famous Buchla low pass gate sound. Um, so what's so interesting about that? Well, 
Hey, Steve, uh, are, are you showing the right picture? I hope so. It's, what are you seeing? I still see the complex oscillator and the quad function generator and the dynamic manager. Yeah, the dyna I'm talking about the dynamics manager. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. No problem. Um, so the low pass gate is a combination. It's, it's really called the quad dynamics manager, but you, you create a low pass gate by pushing that green button and saying low pass and gate are lit up. And what that means is that you have this wonderful circuitry that mimics the way sounds actually sound. So um, if I, I think I have a drum over here. When I hit a drum, you hear a ping of me hitting it. That ping has a lot more high frequency content than the ring out itself. And by com combining a low pass filter into a gate circuitry, you recreate these percussion sounds. And that's what gives the Buchla its unique percussive sound. And I'll get, I'll show you some of that in a little while. Um, so again, it, these are very dense modules, right? Two oscillators in the complex waveform generator, quad function generators that double as LFOs and trigger, uh, trigger outputs, and of course the low pass gate, which there are four of in this module. So um, again, if you look at all of these knobs, all of these buttons, the switches, everything on this system, um, actually, let me go back. Notice that every one of these uh, modules has what is called remote enable. At the top of the complex waveform generator over on the left, remote enable. At the bottom of the quad function generator, which is in the middle, in the middle there at the bottom, remote, remote enable. Um, on the quad dynamics manager, remote enable. That means that every knob position, every button position, everything that isn't a patch cord is memorized and can be recalled instantaneously. Um, imagine in, in, in the Eurorack world, basically it would be like being able to instantly repatch and get back to your original settings of a performance you're doing one night to the next night to the next. And I can go in and mess with all these knobs, hit my little button on my Buchla for that, that preset and all of them will snap back, not physically, internally to where they were for that, uh, for that, uh, uh, that uh, setting. Uh, it's pretty amazing and it's very, very powerful, uh, especially for those who enjoy playing live. Um, any, maybe I can stop and take, a, if there's any questions, um, I'd be willing to take a couple now. I'll ask, uh, I, go on and I'll ask a question after you. All right, I just wanted to make a clarification on the control voltages. It's 1.2 volts per octave for Buchla and one volt per octave for Moog and Eurorack. And so it's one twelfth of a volt per semitone in Buchla and uh, I'm sorry, one twelfth of a volt in, per semitone in Moog, and one tenth of a volt per semitone in Buchla. I mean, I, it's probably what you meant, but I just wanted to clarify that for the for the video. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. On to my <laughs> question: How come we don't have an ADSR Vladimir Usochevsky style envelope in Buchla world? Um, you actually do, um, and if you. Uh, I should bring this back up again. In the uh, in the function generator, you can uh, you can set up you can tie two of them together to create an ADSR function uh, in quadrature mode and mix their outputs to get a single output. So you do it. He just doesn't call it that. Fair enough. Any other questions regarding those modules? I'll ask one more question. Was there a the MARF around when you got your original 200? <laughs> I, you know, it's interesting. When I went, when I was hanging out with Buchla when I was designing the system, he said, I have a new sequencer called a MARF. Are you interested? Uh, and I, uh, he, he didn't have it yet, but he told me about it. And I said, absolutely. So yes, the MARF was a part of my original 200 series. And that's the model you should have kept. That's the most, oh, best sequencer ever. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? This is 1977. This is a sequencer that you could you could put in uh, a, you could voltage control location. 
I mean, it just, it was so far ahead of its time. And it, it was the MARF that I used to create the opening of the Reading Rainbow theme song. And oh, that's uh, nice how that ties in. It, it ties in perfectly. And it's, uh, yeah. And you know what's really crazy? I didn't know this till like five or six years ago. I think he only made eight or nine of them in total. An original MARF is worth a lot more than I sold my whole system for back in, right. in, in the 90s. Right. The guy from Sputnik Modular, I think, has reissued it. Roman. Yeah. Yeah, Roman. Yeah, I, I don't think he's currently making them, but yeah, he did. Even Suzanne, Suzanne Chani has one of them. Yeah. But beyond that, being a, quote, pitch sequencer, it could do control voltages, so there could be a source of multi-segment envelope. Absolutely. It, you can morph between the voltages which was really right. cool. It's an amazing uh, device so far ahead of its time. Um, so perhaps what I'll do is perform a little bit now on the 200 series, unless you guys want to see some uh, some more modules up close. I'm happy to, to talk about all the modules. Some sonic examples would be great. You got it. Let me, let me change my camera. Um, Can everybody see that okay? I'll take that as a yes. That is a yes. <laughs> I'm gonna turn off my mic. Uh, if there's a problem with the audio, let me know, but I'm gonna have my mic off for now. So I'll leave it on for a second. Can you hear me okay if I move over here? Yep. Cool. Um, let's listen to the complex oscillator. <laughs> I'm going to go over, over here and in my preset manager, which this is, I'm going to recall a different patch. You might be hearing some change in amplitude because I, there's a lot of panning going on in my performance laptop. So just ignore that. The output of the synth is wiping out your voice, just so you know. Oh, okay. Let me bring that down. How's this level-wise? Perfect. Okay. You can hear the wave shaping of the wave holder. I'm going to recall it over here again. And I basically, I'm using this pad which is an XY pad to control uh, the wave shaping, the timbre shaping, and a low pass filter. So you can hear the variety of sound in there. I'm just gonna move it a little bit. You know, what's important to note too, um, is that um, Don's uh, low pass filters are not resonant. He's not doing the wow thing. You won't find any resonance control on any of Don's low pass filters. It's just his aesthetic. Um, it's a just a different way of thinking about sound. He, he believed in creating complexity to a sound rather than taking complexity away from a sound. So it's a little bit opposite, right? I can start off with a very pure tone and add complexity to it. You know, when I, when I was learning this stuff, you know, 40 years ago, um, we called this in those days additive synthesis, which is really uh, has changed term the terminology of additive synthesis is really different now. Uh, this would be considered more like um, uh, FM synthesis. For instance, I can add FM by sliding up here. Changing the 
frequency of the modulation oscillator here. Um, this keyboard's called the multidimensional kinesthetic input port. I'd like to talk about it a little bit because it's it's a very unique module in the Buchla system. So let me bring this up again as a screen share. Uh, can you guys see that okay? Is that working or is it wrong? It's perfect. Okay, great. Um, so this this module called the multidimensional kinesthetic input port is a type of keyboard module, and it only works with the module on the right, which is the tactile input port. <laughs> so this is a really powerful module because um, every one of these pads can be programmed independently to do whatever you want. It can be tuned independently. It could have different types of outputs. It, it takes a long time to program it, but once you do, you have something that is uniquely yours. Um, if you look on the uh, bottom, you'll see the, uh, what is that? A, a six-sided little control surface, uh, one labeled R and S. Those are basically X, Y pads. And if you look um, on the right of the tactile input port, um, you'll see S and R that they align with those pads. Uh, and so you have the separate out, two separate outputs for each pad, each on the X axis and each on the Y axis. Um, those, th that's all that they do. The, uh, every other one, A through Y, um, can be programmed independently uh, or could be a part of an arpeggiated pattern. So you can say, I wanna take uh, pads A through H and uh, be able to put them into an arpeggiator. And pads uh, I through K, I just want to tr uh, I to trigger uh, pulse output one, J to pulse output two, and K to pulse output three. And then pads L through O, I want to have L put out a pulse, react to location, and put out two different control voltages. M won't have location, but it will react to pressure. I think you get the point. Every pad can be programmed independently and stored um, with your preset uh, uh, for the system. Um, so uh, let me show you, I'll, I'm gonna play a little bit and you'll see how, how that works. I think you can still see the book. I'm gonna turn off my mic for a second and just do a little improv. And just so you know, I'm playing through my laptop, which is set up to do a lot of uh, processing. So I'm gonna start off, you know, with just kind of Buchla sounds, and then I'm gonna take it into another world with some loops and fun stuff. Steve, we're just seeing the screenshot of the controller. We're not seeing your live performance. Oh, you don't, you don't see the Buchla? Well, we just see the static image of the controller. You need to stop screen sharing. Oh, thank you. There you go. Uh, sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, here we go.
So in, in that example, I was trying to uh, show everybody you know, kind of a wide variety of the different sounds that this system can make. Um, any questions? I'll ask a question again, if that's all right. Oh, absolutely, David. Uh, when I run through the modules, it looks like it's a two oscillator system. Mm -hmm. um, you have a source of uncertainty in the, in the boat there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see any patch cords coming from the kinesthetic controller. Is it hardwired to stuff or how's uh, that happening? Yes, yes the, the pad um, is hardwired to its output module, which is located in the system. Okay. Um, I can point that out. Let me just yeah, switch, that'd be great. switch my camera. So you're talking about this, right? The yeah, but I see a module in the upper right quadrant. Is oh, that the output? One. That guy, yeah. Oh, no, that's the that's the MIDI USB decoder module. Okay. The output for the this pad is right here. Okay, okay, my mistake. That's all right, yeah. Um, this module, you're right, there's... Um, and it's a, you actually bring up a very good point. This this module uh, is takes um, MIDI and 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 lets you do all kinds of different things with it. One thing that's very cool is that there's a MIDI bus, and I forgot to mention that that runs through the 200 series that that passes note data from a MIDI controller or a sequencer directly to the sequencers. It can trigger the uh, the, the pulse generators, it can, uh, it, it determines the speed of the uh, arpeggiator that I was using just a little bit while ago. So it's, booklers are highly uh, MIDI compatible. Okay. Can you talk about the integration of the easel with your 200 system? Um, yeah, I'm, I was just going to move over to the easel. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at the easel. Actually, before you do, I was wondering, are you using the uh, velocity inputs at all on the 292? No, I don't believe I am. No, for this, for the way it's set up now, I, I'm not using those. Uh, is there a reason why you're asking? I just, yeah, just wondering if that was kind of part of your performance stuff. I've I haven't really heard good, like good examples of that in use. And I guess I would assume that it would be coming from the um, kinesthetic input port is kind of how you would link those two together. Um, yes, because the kin kinesthetic input port has the ability to react to impact, right? So you can yeah. set it up to react to impact. And I, you know, I've never played a around with that. Uh, uh, it, it brings up a great there's question. Just, there's, there's too many things to play with. You know? No, totally. Yeah. <laughs> How would you voltage control an external signal? So if you want velocity to control amplitude of the envelope going into your uh, quad dynamics. I'm sorry, say that again, please. If you wanted to control the modulation index of something from your, connect, from your control surface. Mm -hmm. So velocity, yet more amplitude swings, say, going into a filter or the quad gate. Mm -hmm. How how would that be uh, patched? Because um, there's no programmable attenuators that are external modules. The attenuators are built into the modules. So if you wanted the voltage to control from a, a third parameter, in this case, velocity, so that a harder touch, more envelope amplitude, more control over index of something, mm -hmm. that set, makes sense. Yeah, well, you could certainly do that using the, the quad dynamics manager. Right. So if you could I, run a control signal through the quad dynamic exactly. and have it act as a voltage control attenuator. Yes. In other words, you could use the velo you could take a velocity input into the quad dynamics manager and then take the output of that specific Right. Uh, but we're not allowed to mix control voltages in audio in a Buchla system. So I'm right. talking about passing a, a DC voltage, varying DC voltage through some sort of module and have its amplitude or parameters controlled by the touch plate. You can do that um, with any of the uh, the processing modules that he makes, which I don't have. Okay. There are right. voltage, there are voltage processing modules that allow you to do those kinds of functions. And, and I think that the the velocity inputs on the two ninety two are would do what you're asking. 
like they they would change the level of the envelope they controlling would totally, they would totally do that so you have to think about use i know you're thinking about in terms of control voltages but what you're really trying to do is change the modulation index of something correct well it could be slow attack versus a heart attack or you know a sharp percussive versus a slow laggy Absolutely. based off of how you attack or play the control surface right so basically you would take the output of the um the, the uh sorry what am i thinking of the uh impact from from the uh the static input port and put that into the the uh into the uh, attack uh voltage uh control of the uh, uh of the function generator exactly thank you for that so I, I have a question. Um, when you're talking about velocity, you're real, really talking about pressure or how much of your skin is contacting the surface? Um, no, because that's a separate setting. On oh, okay. Screen. So there is literally velocity, like how yeah. hard you hit the key. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and it, it's pretty fascinating. There's location in terms of up and down across it. It's how hard you hit it and also pressing it. Wow. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, stuff to play with here. Um, let's take a look at the easel because it's quite a, a different, uh, quite a different beast. Let me bring that up. Can I just ask a quick question about the easel? I mean, sure. The... Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I just have a quick question about your, your setup, which is rather modest. <laughs> have you been tempted to add more 200 modules to your setup because we often see on matrix synth and on muff wiggler and whatnot massive systems with like 20 modules 20 30 modules right and you've kept yours the same size as far as whenever i've been watching you there's a reason for that because I, I like to travel patched mm -hmm. uh, and so this system folds up I can right. travel patched. The other thing is I tried to take a big advantage of designing my patches with the idea that, um, and because I, I do a lot of looping and capturing of sounds with the idea that I can just pick a new preset if I want a new sound. Why do I need to have 30 more modules to create a new sound? Hmm. You know? Good point. I, I love working within small, um, very manageable, um parameters now mind you i have a, a, a library of modules behind me that aren't in this system that i bring in and out occasionally and if i do get a if i do want to expand i would buy another one of these cases because i'm not sure whether you guys uh, let, let me show you let me just go back real quick i just want to explain how how modular so to speak uh this system is because this whole top section folds over on top of this and remains patched. And uh, he's getting the bag. He's getting the bag. Yes. Hold on. Sorry, guys. Let me switch back cameras here. While you're doing that, I'll mention the fact that the Buchla modules are so dense, you know, it's almost superfluous to, in, in some cases to have a huge system. My system fits in this bag and fits in the uh, luggage rack of any airplane. But you do have to be careful folding it if you have more than two banana jacks stacked, right? Because then you can get, run into trouble. Yeah, well, that's easy because you just plug them into the side then. Right. You know? And always you always good. carry it inside the airplane with you. Uh, yeah. You never let it go out of your sight. You know, that's not always true. I, I do have a, a really cool, huge, thick travel case that's about five times the size of that, um, that I do put it into also, and uh, I know it won't be damaged. But, you know, there's nothing so nothing cooler than folding this in half, putting it in my little bag and running down to the city and doing a concert, knowing that I'm, I'm set up and ready to go. I don't have to think about patching. I don't have any worries. I know exactly what I'm gonna perform. Uh, and that's kind of the way I am. I'm more of a live performer, okay. uh, moving from location to location. And I just don't want to have the pressure of having to patch 
before every performance. What are you using for a looper? Um, it's software looper. Um, Ableton Live? No, I'm, I'm using, I, I run Logic and I'm using a looping module in Logic called, uh, not, it's not a Logic plugin, called Augustus Loops by Expert Sleeper. Okay. It's a, it's a really cool system. And maybe uh, an, I'll show you my Logic setups on another one of these. Uh, if I do another seminar, because the, the logic project alone is is as a whole two hours. It's about four oh. years of setting it up. It's got uh, one, two, three, four, five. It's got ten Augustus loopers running and uh, buttons that open up and send things into different types of modulation. This is a hardware right. device that interfaces to logic. Is that what you're describing? Excuse me. Is this a hardware device that interfaces to logic? No, it's 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 all it's all in running internally in logic. So it's, it's, it's all software based. It's all software based. Yeah. All right. This is the first time I've heard of this. So, Augustus See, Loops, very powerful. Yeah, I'll check it out. Thanks. I love it. Um, onto the easel. Okay. That's not the easel. Here's the easel. Um, Okay, easel is a completely different beast in that um, it combines the the touch active, uh, the you know the two eighteen e, which is the touch activated voltage source. I just want to say this: when you when you get to, around a bunch of Buchla people, they always talk about the modules in terms of the number. So yeah, I'll plug the two ninety two and do the. I know Kyle's raising his hand there. <laughs> um, you know, they're talking about numbers and, and non buccal people have no idea what they're talking about. And I, I keep telling people who are trying to teach people, other people about buccal is stop using the numbers. It's just too exclusionary. Um, so anyways, this is called the touch activated voltage source. It's married to, and it's number is 218. And it's married to the stored program sound source uh, 208. This is a, um, an easel that was made by um, uh, actually, oh yeah, Buchla Electronic Musical Instruments. This isn't uh, Buchla and Associates easel. I, I purchased this from the, Buchla's gone through so many different versions of companies, but this was an Australian company that that purchased them and, and reissued the easel. Um, the easel, um, you'll notice that the, uh, it has outputs at the top, it's a pulse output, goes into the pulse the keyboard's pulse output goes into the pulse out input of the keyboard. Uh, is, this is called the keyboard connection section. So this is how you connect this keyboard into the actual sound part of the easel. So you have uh, pulse, you have pressure, and you have pitch. So every one of these pads is pressure sensitive. It has a pressure sensitive output. Now, um, there's uh, rows along the bottom here where all of these different types of pulses uh, and volt control voltages come out and can be repatched. But the great thing about the easel is that it's 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 hardwired, um, and so basically, I'm going to move from left to right. You have a sequential voltage source here. It's a five-stage sequencer, not eight or four, as you would imagine most buclas uh, or most most systems are. Uh, you have an envelope generator. You have a pulser that just puts out a rhythmic pulse. Um, you have a modulation oscillator. I think you all know what that is now. You have a complex oscillator. So that's the same functionality as in the 200s uh, series stuff. And you have a, a dual, dual low pass gate module and some output stuff here. So um, I've got a lot of processing on here. Let me turn some on. Okay. This is a great place to listen to the the complex oscillator. Let me um, let me uh, switch a couple of things off. So there's the 
there you can hear the complex oscillator. In this patch, I have the sequencer output running into the timbre control of the complex oscillator. So when I use the built-in arpeggiator, which this has, what you get is this. So the keyboard has a built-in uh, arpeggiator. You can, it only gives you the option of ascending or random. You have the rate. has an actual spring reverb, which I actually adore. Nothing like the sound of a good spring reverb. I haven't heard a, uh, a, a modeled one that I like nearly as much. Um, you have uh, th these four presets here. Uh, right now they're set to octaves. However, if I slide it to preset, you can adjust it. Let's talk about the sequencer. I, I love playing the, the sequencer on this. And I'll tell you why, because I, I use the sequencer to change the timbre of the complex oscillator. And what that does is create interesting musical accents. The sequencer can be switched from three stages to four to five. So if I have it in three, and I, if I hold down three notes, holding down a three notes and the stage is set to three notes and one of those stages is is set to its highest level so it's pushing the timbre of the complex oscillator to you know a certain level of complexity but when i switch it to four notes it starts phasing three against four because i'm holding down three notes but there's four stages it creates a completely different pattern Using the same three notes. If I switch it to five, I get a, still a different pattern. If I hold down four notes, so it's four notes, a five note pattern. If I switch it to, if I switch it to four notes, it's a four note, uh, pa uh, four notes and a four stage sequencer and it will get very repetitive as you'd expect and if i switch it to three notes i get a whole different pattern and this gets to be a lot of fun when you start uh using looping so let me let me just do something here a little three note pattern now to four notes and capture that in a loop.
favorite processor. Um, so that's basically the easel. It's a very powerful little instrument that can do all kinds of things. I use it a lot to play more of, more of the tonal stuff that I like to do. However, it could get pretty wild too. So let me, let me show you that. Now I'm going to mess with the complex So that's a little quick tour of the uh, the easel. Fun instrument, really fun. Any Especially, questions? Yeah, it's, uh, as an easel owner myself, the audio, being able to process external audio is really fascinating. Being able to take the audio out of the easel and run it back into the easel and do feedback patches is really excellent. Um, the way you patch it with those uh, little banana shorting bars is really, really clever. Exactly. Uh, the, the card slot, which Steve didn't touch on, that's an, another interesting um, addition there. Presets before presets were presets. There you go. Oh, yeah, the iProgram card. Yeah, the iProgram card allows you to use an iPad uh, to basically the iPad brings up an easel like surface, control surface. And with the iProgram card, you sit there with the iPad and you can basically change everything on the surface and even more stuff that the easel can't do uh, and store it as a preset. So again, you know, this is the magic of Wukla, the preset type stuff. Um, this is something that Don designed, what, anyone knows this, 1973, I think, is that? Yeah, I think so. Right? Every connection and switch position on this inner, on this part of the, the, uh, the easel, this program, this card slot, you can't see it. I'm sorry. Let me switch back over just so you guys can see this. Sorry, I have to cycle through. There's a card slot right here. Um, the That iProgram card fits right in there. But that's a rather new addition to the easel world. Um, when Don designed this, he uh, sold it with circuit boards. And those circuit boards allowed you to patch everything that you see on here and create like a preset with a circuit board. So all this stuff that you see here terminates. All right. Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Kyle. That's, uh, I never had one of those. Have you? Have really? You, yeah, Kyle, yours didn't come with them? I, mine came with five. Yeah. You know, I, I got a special deal. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> I'll send you one. Have you, have you done it yet, Kyle? No, I'm, I'm, I, I say I'm soldering illiterate, but, uh, but no, I need to. Yeah. It's, it's, you have to have a lot of resistors of very specific values, but one of the neat things about that program card is it exposes a lot of features you can't get to from the front, front panel. Exactly. And you can get Todd to build them for you. So if you have a patch in mind, he, he, he will put it together for you. The, uh, th there's for also fee. a lot of, there's a lot of third party things that plug in there now too, that do a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. I have one of those, the, the two eight, uh, Toolbox is a really, really great one. Yeah. I like that one too. Did you have your arpeggiator synced to MIDI or something like that? Yeah. Everything that I do is always synced to MIDI because okay. uh, otherwise the looping would get a little crazy. 
And I yeah, go, or yeah, I was just like, wow, that's up, that's on point. So that makes yeah, sense. No, the, <laughs> everything. I'm, I'm I'm running a laptop here constantly that's shooting out MIDI, and it's, it's sending MIDI to both of my uh, uh, my easel and my 200D, and that way I can get them to sync. I can make sure that the effects are syncing properly. And when, when you plug MIDI, by the way, into an easel, the arpeggiator breaks down into whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, or or just just equal divisions, duple divisions on that side. And on the other side, it's uh, triple divisions. Yeah, and I didn't know about that until Steve told me about that. And it blew my mind and totally made the easel more useful to me in, in a huge way. I remember when I told <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, I was like, like wow. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Clock divider, that, oh, so cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's neat. Well, I think that's probably, we're getting, how long have we been doing this? I don't even know. Uh, about an hour and a half, a little short of an hour and a half. I'm happy to answer any more questions if anybody has any. Any comments about the easel with the kinetic touchpad? I've seen that in the past as a configuration. It's, it's not on the Buchla site currently. Which which touchpad? I'm sorry. The touchpad you have on the 200 paired with the um oh i see what you're saying yeah, yeah he's talking the, about that that the version of, input a version i think it was yeah, called the k version yeah the k version it, you know somehow i just can't wrap my head around it uh let me switch back to my camera hold on you know i i've looked at that i'm going really hmm but i i don't know i i, I, I agree <laughs> I, guess, yeah. I guess because i have a 200e that I think of the easel as a self-contained instrument and that, you know, it's the way I kind of com compartmentalize things. It's just my way of doing it. I tried it. It's a whole new architecture. You just got to like spend a whole day. And it, yeah. It's Matt, it's mixing apples and oranges, sort of buccal apples and oranges. Okay. I'll ask a more question that that's more focused. How do you use the 200, uh, the 10 E the control signal router? You've got my in your system, right? Well, you know what? I don't, Hmm. This is kind of embarrassing because I've, I've always been a big uh, believer in using real Buchla modules. It's just kind of my thing. Um, but I have to admit, I'm, I'm actually running uh, the control and signal router made by uh, Doug Louder. Doug Clowder? Clowder, yeah. Studio yeah. H. Studio yeah, H. Yeah, I was surprised to see that. That's cool. Um, and I have I have the, the, a Buchla one, but the problem was is that because I do some pitch stuff over here, uh -huh. Buchla one just wasn't doing it, and and Doug's really is rock solid in terms of. Is he uh, the guy who makes the clock generator with all the divisions? There's like a ratchet module or something out. No, I don't. I think that's someone else. Is it E compatible? West? What? Is, does yeah. it have patch memory in it too? Yeah. Wow. Do you find you use it a lot in your patches because it seems like it's such a malleable, important. In, in and out sort of routing as its name implies. You know, let me, let me bring up a picture of it so everyone can see what we're talking about because it's a really interesting module. Hold on. I'll bring up the Buchla version of it. Share screen. Boom. There we go. Can you guys see that okay? Yep. Cool. So this is... This is like the world's coolest and most <laughs> complicated way of thinking module ever made. Basically, it takes the top part is for audio. It takes eight audio inputs and allows you to matrix them to any of the five audio outputs. So all of them can go to one or one can go to all or anything in between um, and allows you to set amplitude levels individually for each one. So it's kind wow. of a matrix mixer, right? That's basically what this is, is a matrix mixer. Uh, pretty powerful, right? And the same thing down below, um, which is uh, the eight control voltages in, here you see on the left, and the the five control voltages on the out. And yes, each one can be, uh, you know, tweaked. You can, it's, uh, you can change, you can adjust the levels that go to each of the outputs. So, I was thinking that this is something that I really needed. Imagine taking all of my possible important audio outputs 
and having them with the push of a button using the preset controller, right? Because they will store all of these setups uh, to any output. I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. Imagine I can take a, a small system like I have here and, and even do 10 times more stuff with it because I can route anything to anywhere now, right? It's, it's, like, it's like removing the patch cables in a sense or adding a thousand more patch cables depending on as you know as long as you don't mind the massive amount of planning work you have to do well that's the whole thing right mike is that i i started getting into it i'm going holy mackerel um it's kind of <laughs> I have to really, it's it's like you need a you need a whole friggin uh you know book to, to figure this out and to patch it properly and to get it to work and then trying to troubleshoot it um oh my god you know because you got to you know, it's just it's it would be kind of a nightmare i i i still think i can make good use of this thing uh especially now that doug's is a little truer in terms of its voltage output when it comes to pitch stuff uh and i you know it's my goal this year i ordered a bunch of new patch cords because you need a shitload more patch oh my cords. god <laughs> yeah the modulation possibilities that's that intrigues me oh it's totally intriguing right if you start like mixing everything together in strange ways uh, I'll get there someday. Uh, I, I wish I, I could spend every day just uh, exploring a lot of the things that I still don't know about this system. And that's kind of what you kind of discover um, about Buchla systems. Now, I kind of wanted just to talk about that. Just one quick thing is that, you know, I, I said early on that Buchla really never thought of his thing as a synthesizer. He really thought of it as an instrument. And this, this, his systems are really are designed to be played. Um, they, the modules all work together. There's, um, there's something that makes it feel like it's an instrument. And as much as I love Eurorack, I really like the way that I feel like I'm playing someone else's concept of what an instrument is rather than a mishmash of modules. I'm looking over my, my Eurorack, you know, all with different nomenclature with like completely different ways of patching. And once it's all patched up, it's impossible to figure out to go in and troubleshoot. I find that the Buchla systems in general are, you know, I don't know, the uniformity of the patching, I guess, is appealing to me. And I love the sound of them. That's not to say I haven't inserted Eurorax in a Buchla system. Buchla does make the blades the Buchla blades where you can actually insert your favorite Eurorack modules um, in the Buchla system. Have you guys ever seen the Buchla blades? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So I always found that the mutable instrument stuff sounds really good with Buchla stuff. So I used to, you know, put in a couple of rings and bring those into my system just because it was a lot of fun. They sound good together. I always found that Buchla stuff really sounds great with string sounds for some reason, pianos and guitars. And, yeah, a friend of mine has some converted rings modules in his Buchla system. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're the right panel size and color coordination and banana jacks. It's great. Yeah, no, it's totally cool. Totally cool. Um, uh, I could bring up pictures of more modules and talk about them, uh, or we can call it a night, whatever you guys want to do. Do you have any pictures of the blades? Oh, I have one. I'll just grab one. Hold on. Perfect. Find it. You know, while Steve's looking for it, um, I've had numerous discussions online with folks about getting the blade for your bukla. And since usually in a bukla boat or whatever, you're you have limited space. So what I use is just these really inexpensive 4MS systems with the SGVT module. Yeah. And so you've got a little box just next to your Buchla, be it in a 200 or an easel, and you've got all of your Eurorack stuff in a much less expensive box than using up the precious Buchla real estate. There's a lot to that. I totally agree. Um, I mean, some people like having it er ergonomically right in front of you, but I find because, you know, real estate at a premium in a, in a Buchla system, just having this small 
4MS or other, there's many cheap in, or inexpensive, I'll say, Eurat boats that are like all sizes and you just have it right next to it with the SGVT and it works just like a charm. So that's that's what I do with my Buchla and it, and it's my easel and it's outboard Eurorack stuff. I see Todd Barton doing that a lot too. Yeah, again, I, I like to travel cheap and, and small. So, you know, having more things to carry and worry about, I don't like that. Yeah, the, those boats, you yeah. know. This, this is the polyglot version. You stop making you don't see it. Oh, you're still you sharing, sharing your screen. Oh, share, stop share. Here we go. How now? Can you guys see that, that looks almost exactly like my five view, uh, your rack adapter. That's cool. Yeah. So it does all the, the conversions and everything are right in there. It's, uh, that make a great awesome. Facebook page, Steve. <laughs> there, yeah, exactly. With your head between, yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's Honey, hilarious. I'm home. No. <laughs> Here's Johnny. Yeah. Uh, I hate to ask this. Don't hate me, but you think we'll ever see a Behringer Buchla clone? <laughs> My guess is yes. <laughs> they're, they're killing everybody else, right? I think it might be hard with Buchla being a growing, a, a continuing concern, but anything's possible. I think Behringer knows when to stop. Mm, I would I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> that key step clone was a bridge too far, I think. Oh man, they, they took a lot of heat for that, right? They sure did. Holy mackerel. I have a question. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer it. Um, do you have any insight into Don's thought process in coming up with this all this stuff like uh, well, uh, like take the, the low pass gate. Would it, is, is there someone, or maybe he thought, well, I'd like to do this. What can I build to do this? Or, well, I've got all this stuff here. Let's put it together this way and see what it does. Cause it, it's so unlike any, you know, Moog, Eurorack, art type stuff. It's just like a, yeah. Like it was constantly on LSD or something and just putting stuff on circuit boards and <laughs> seeing what would happen. The truth is, you know, I think Don was just a real genius and, and a creative genius. And I, I don't think it was happenstance at all. I think he really understood circuitry on such a very deep level that, and circuit design that these were things that he just wanted to do. He just said, you know, I, I know I can make a oscillator that sounds really cool if I, if I do some wave shaping, you know, or I don't know I think, if anyone can get inside Don Buchla's brain, but I think the low, low pass gate is a really good example of that because using a Vactrol, which is right. like an, a light controlled device is a really odd choice from an engineering standpoint, but there's nothing better for making drum sounds than a low pass gate. Yep. And he knew that. He, he, mm -hmm. knew that. he figured that out. It's um, probably something he kind of fell into as well, because I don't I don't think he was using Vactrols or for the gates weren't Vactrol based on like the 100 series. So they absolutely were not. Yeah. So it That's seems like, you know, he fell into that at some point and also probably with Mort in his ear too, asking for different things like it. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if Mort had a lot of influence on that. Yeah, not like that Morton really understood circuit design, but yeah, I just think that he was a dreamer, yeah. you know. And he I also, I also had read that he reverse engineered. He came up with his panel design first, saying, "I want to modulate. I want my main oscillator here, my modulation oscillator here, and I want the way it was set up." And then he built the face plates first, or designed them, and then sort of worked backwards. Unlike that, that doesn't coastal. surprise me because he was so into performing. I mean, he performed all the time. It wasn't like he was just some kind of electronics guy only. He was a performer also. And what, what is so attractive to me about the Buchlis, is you just want to grab them and touch them and, and, and interact with them in ways that you don't really feel that way with most other instruments. And there's no denying it. When a lay person sees a Buchla, because, you know, I've had friends come to my concerts or, or regardless of the situation you know they look at a mode modular or a surge or something it's one thing but then when people see them the buchla 200 especially 
and they see these lights, people are like visually seduced by it for better or for worse. And I'm talking about lay people, not necessarily electronic musicians. Yeah. They look at it and they say, that's like a lot of eye candy. Well, you know what? He was also one of the first to give you that kind of visual feedback, right? The LEDs, you know, yeah. showing you what's it's, happening. It's all, it all has a purpose, but it, visually it's a much more yeah. sensual instrument. You know, and I, uh, I've tried, I've tried going the other way. I've tried going completely Eurorack and I just, Eurorack and I just keep coming back to the booth. Eurorack's too small. You can't get your fingers in there. Exactly. Like it's for, for munchkins. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a five U guy too. And <laughs> I, I can relate to that in a huge way. Here's Fat one thing I'd like to hear uh, some of the people on this Zoom call talk about when I got into the 100 series, um, late eighties. I like the idea of the shift register sequencer and you could visually see it and you could patch different stages and typically a system would have not just one but two of them and the two of them would be able to interact, you know, sort of uh, Terry Riley, Philip Glass type mm -hmm. cascades mm -hmm. are possible. We don't see that in today's systems, you know, that visual feedback and that you can interact as the sequencer is, is moving along. Uh, I don't know how you address that in a system like yours, Steve, but. Well, I, I address it by, uh, maybe not with visual feedback, but because I, I can create uh, any amount of asymmetrical loops because it's a software-based looping system. But can you control the number of stages from your controller in real time? And no, I, I have to make a choice at the very beginning. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? V throwing an arpeggiated you know, a bunch of notes into a, a looper, I can make it a, a two note loop, three note loop, or a 25 minute loop. Right. And what I like about the way I I'm approaching it is that these loops don't ever come back into alignment necessarily because there's no one necessarily, you know, it's like one could be running for four seconds and the other one five and one's running for 10 seconds and 12 and they they just interact in a way and though and, and though it's um often there's a certain amount of unpredictableness to it mm -hmm. that's what i find really attractive i i oh, so when, much when i sit down on a bookless system i mean this whole it's almost like i'm i'm uh, interacting with another performer right i will often get something that inspires me to do something else and interact with it in a way. And so by, by taking an idea and looping it, and it enables me to go, wow, now I can add this to that because that's how it makes me feel at this moment. The last question for me tonight would be any interaction with the verbose electronics, because that kind of came out of the Buchla to Eurorack transition. Um, no, I mean, I've, I've hung out with verbose a lot. He's a really great guy. And he's the one who told me, you sold your Marf? The Tapuka only made eight of those. <laughs> You're crazy. I went, oh no, I guess I was crazy. Um, no, uh, I have, I've never used any of the, the Verbo stuff. I think he does really cool things. They're great modules. They're very Bukla esque even though they're Eurorack. I, I once bought a module, uh, one of his modules for a friend of mine, but I never owned one. Yeah, I, I want to throw out a comment about the, the last question. It's, it's, this is something that some of you may know and some of you may not. And beginners fall into this trap. And there's a phrase that I like to repeat. It's like a mantra. Limitation breeds creativity. So if your system doesn't do everything you could possibly think of, embrace that. Because sometimes those limitations will lead you down paths you wouldn't have gone down otherwise. So, you know, work within the confines of what you got and, and maximize that before you make a decision to buy another magical module that'll add more complexity and more choices to your system. I, I yeah. totally agree, man. I mean, I say it a little differently. It's that I don't want my violin sounding like my piano. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a nice way of saying it. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, this, this system has limitations. There's no doubt about it. But there's a whole freaking universe within those limitations. Sure. You know? And yeah, would I like some new Buchla design modules? Yeah, I kind of wonder what was in Don's head before he passed away, you know? Luckily, there's some 
great people working at Buchla right now that I think are coming up with some um, stuff that were, was perhaps even in his head. I think that the easel commander is a is a pretty neat thing because it's take it's evolving the easel into a world where you can get into some of those hidden functions with with patch cables that you couldn't before. Yeah, and the fact that it's kind of a tabletop thing and you can hook mm -hmm. it up with MIDI and use other controllers and yeah. yeah like a Sensei Morph, exact, for, for exactly. example. Exactly. Um, there's a few Buchla modules I'd still like to, to get that I don't have, but um, I would have to put them in another Skylab case because I, I think my ideal system at this point is two Skylab cases so that I can just kind of walk in carrying two things, right? Um, and there's a way to connect them bus-wise so that they can work together. Uh, Doug Clowder, by the way, makes those, uh, the way you can pass the data in between them and, 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 and connect them up. So uh, that's probably my next purchase will just be a Skylab case, a couple of modules, fill it out and have them both run off the same preset manager, which would be really amazing. Anybody else want to chat? Um, I guess going back to, um, I think it was Mike saying, you know, embrace those limitations and stuff. And I always, I think when we talked last year, I, it still blows me away. It's like, there's no sequencer in your system and you are the sequencer with the, uh, with the looping and stuff. And uh, I just love that about how you perform. It's oh man, thanks Kyle, appreciate that. Fire. Thank you. Yeah, I can't wait to get a new M1 Mac. That way I can probably have like 50 uh, loopers running. No doubt. Yeah, I'm, I'm readjusting my patch now. As I said, I, I think I have five loopers that actually capture uh, the, the sequences, but I have another six loopers that are part of just a plug-in configuration that I send sounds into and do crazy things. So I got a lot of loopers working in there and they're pretty intensive in terms of CPU. Um, I'm, I'm redoing my patch right now so I can get all of that conglomerate captured into one more looper, right? In quad, right? Because I perform in quad uh, and have that running and then build up another set of loops, right? But I'm, 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 like, I'm like driving a, uh, I'm like piloting a, a 747 two feet off the ground here in terms of CPU, you know, at, at, at you know, 500 miles an hour. It, it's, you, you should see my CPU thing. It's like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just take this one reverb out and see if I can just get it to fit in there, you know? <laughs> uh, so the new M1 Mac, MacBook Pros, I think are gonna solve a lot of problems. Hey, how do you guys feel about the Arturia software version of the easel? Um, I've used it and, and I have a lot of friends at Arturia because we do a lot of business with them through our training company. I think it's it's a really great sounding unit, actually. I'm 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 not totally into it. Uh, For those that don't have a Buchla yet, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty good option. I I, I mean, it, you know, it it certainly is close enough for government work, you know. Yeah, no, it's it definitely sounds great. I think. I mean, it does it's a right. trick? Is it really, a Buchla though. I just you know I don't know you know. Okay. I, I have a lot of mixed feelings, and I, I know that I've talked with Kyle about this, is all the, the, the different types of clones that are out and people making their own versions of Buchla modules. And I, I'm such a purist. I really want to stay as much as possible within Don's vision here. Be, Yet you have a Doug module in your boat. What's that? You have a Doug module in your system. Yeah, man. Believe me, I was, I was, uh, that's the only one I promise. <laughs> that's okay that was the main issue of pitch drift yeah just the uh, uh don's version of it just wasn't accurate enough or maybe because i bought it used maybe it was just the module itself i don't know okay but I, when i called yeah. doug and i told him my problem he said yeah i know buy mine mm -hmm. <laughs> are you able to plot the input so it can sequentially change things no i haven't done that yet i mean is there, is there a pulse input so that you can change oh the mix in real time no no but there is a pulse input on the preset manager you can you can sequence through the different 
presets that reset your whole system, which is kind and of- There you cool. go. Interesting. I just have a quick question before going in deep, into deeper water. <laughs> you're you're taking your signals and you're looping them on, uh, I forget the name of that plugin or whatever for uh, on the yeah. laptop. Augustus loops, yeah. Right, you're still, you have to control the tempo of the loops and whatnot. Are you using any kind of controller, fader box or anything? So yes. You can, well, to, to like a fader fox or something, so you can- all, the the tempo the, the this the synchronization tempo shall we call it is coming from my laptop, right? Because both the easel and the two hundred e accept MIDI sync. Right. Right. However, in terms of uh, controlling how things are uh, being processed, I, I have a very I'll just unplug it. Okay, so you have a controller to yeah. That's I, what Morton Sabotnik's using these days. So I saw him use it. It's like there's there's enough buttons and knobs on this thing. You can do a lot, you know. Yeah. And they're cheap. And they're cheap as hell. And you can buy two, you know. <laughs> I use the Fader Fox, which I find are great because they got nice, good throws on the uh, faders. Oh yeah, they're fantastic. They're great, and they run on batteries. <laughs> the older ones. I still have five knobs I haven't used yet on this. I'm, I'm, I dream about that at night. What am I gonna? <laughs> You know, maybe I can add some ring modulation with this. You thing. too, huh? <laughs> Without a doubt, man. Without a doubt. The um, answer is always ring modulation. So yeah, you're right. <laughs> or balance modulation, excuse me, if we're talking Buchla language. Well, thanks, Steve. I hope you'll come back and honor us with another session. Yeah, I'd love Let's go to. Go on for uh, another two hours. <laughs> Easily. Thanks, brother. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and I, I encourage you to, if you haven't heard Steve live, to to get to one of his performances. And if you haven't heard any of his recordings, go get them because they're fantastic. I've been playing them on my FM radio show for a while now since I got them. So I'm excited about that new CD that's coming. I can't wait. Yeah, I, I, I remember when I last saw you, Mike, I played a little bit of what I was trying to do. So I've got uh, 17 easel pieces completed now. Oh, oh sweet. Uh, and... Uh, I'm probably going to narrow it down to 12 or 13 because there's a couple of uh, losers. Well, in only 12 or 13. <laughs> but uh, it's running a little long. <laughs> That's but, okay. Uh, That's what Bandcamp is for, right? Exactly. But thank you, everybody, for coming out and hanging Thanks out. Thanks a lot, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks again, Steve. Uh, Steve Horlick. So look him up on YouTube and on the Internet in general and buy some of his recordings and go some, to some of his performances. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve.